So hi everyone and welcome to the channel. A very, very quick intro into this video. This is the Zoom chat that was conducted uh, a week or so ago and there was one about a month before that. But I got permission to record it, so thank you Owen and Colin for recording this. Um, I've edited it down as much as I can, but this, this video covers all aspects of the Open Series weekends, how they're made up, what the, the tasks are all about, hints and tips of how to perform the tasks, etc. Even from the, the navigation elements, photographs, precision landings etc etc uh, if you've got any questions following this um, video please drop them in the comments and I will either get Owen to jump into the chat and uh, answer them or in terms of it is enough of a variety of questions we'll make a follow-on video to answer those questions but anyway let's jump into the video and say hold those questions drop them in the comments and I'll see you at the end of the video evening try not to read too much of the slides but really understand um, what a typical open weekend is like and if you'd like to attend you don't just turn up on either the Friday uh, or the Saturday morning and go what's this all about you know you've had a chance to warm up to the idea of it and perhaps try and reduce that um, imposter syndrome um, so that's the main thing also turn up so you're prepared and ready and you can hopefully have you know the best weekend rather than oh I wish I'd known this or I wish I'd known that um, understand what a typical task is like. So Colin and I will talk through a couple of um, do's and don'ts and a few hints and tips there. Uh, equipment, and that's um, glad to see Giles attend this evening. He's been doing a couple of simple tasks and also checking out equipment and he'll give his insight onto that and then also ask any questions. Um, so that's the plan. It's just designed to take away that that sort of, oh, what am I doing here as you walk into a clubhouse or a marquee for the first event? The first event is just just under a month or just over a month away at Darley Moor. Um, so we want to give people at least four or five weeks to think about it and plan um, and come prepared. That's the that's the plan, really. I'm, I'm obviously the organiser of this evening, um, relatively experienced weight shift pilot, um, competition organiser, open series organiser, and flown in the um, odd, odd uh, international competition. Has, as has Colin, um, who will be presenting a typical task and hints and tips. He's very experienced. Weight shift and three axis. I think when I talk, I know I talk pretty much from a trike perspective and fall into the habit of doing that, but Colin can give both perspectives as well. Um, the last event we had on the February, uh, Spencer and a few three axis guys and Fly Sky Rangers uh, were talking and going, oh, that's a useful tip. Oh, I hadn't thought about that for the cockpit rather than um you know a, a trike uh, it, but uh, yeah Colin can give some experience of weight shift and three axis as well so just a bit of background I think this is important and you'll hear me and I did it a minute ago I slipped into the word the nationals and um uh, I've been I've been flying uh, competitions for quite a long time as has Colin and has I think Andy um Andy fellows on the meeting tonight has done as well and we sometimes flip it into that or switch into that oh well we did the comps or we did the nationals and Back in the day, we used to do the comps and actually we found it became a little bit uh, insular um, and it was perceived um, probably quite rightly, actually, that it was all the, the top pilots and all the people that you, you know, these um, medalists and people like that would be flying and how could I access it, you know, and it was quite a daunting prospect. So what we've done um, is we called, we renamed it, so Nationals to Open. And these are the aims here to make it more inclusive, focus much more on flying skills, hopefully more enjoyable. I think when I first started flying some of the competitions as an early hours pilot, I'd go home at the weekend and, and it was a bit like you just had a bit of a thrashing really. And you'd be like been flying around, working really hard and hadn't had a great deal to show for it. And it felt a bit um, a bit dispiriting. So the plan is that people come away from an open series saying, well, I've learned A, B and C. I've achieved X, Y and Z. I've met some really good people had a good social time as well. And I'd like to do more flying as a consequence. Uh, I think the other shift that happened between changing it to open series is really put safety and skills first. It used to be frowned upon about, you know, GPS. Well, we live in a, an era of certainly Sky Demon and Sky and, and GPS is quite common. So if you want to take it with you and have it as a backup, you can turn it on, you can fly with it if you want. I don't think it's a massive advantage or disadvantages. We've taken out the scary fuel limited tasks, which I think makes a big difference. And at the same time, 
we had a few pilots last year. You can feed it into wings or Calibri accreditation as well. So you can, you know, you build it all up and hopefully get those BMAA wing schemes, whether it be bronze, silver, gold or diamond. So that's that's the plan, really. So if you hear me say comps or nationals, then uh, I'm sorry. And I should be saying open series. And I suppose it's it's not really competitors. It's more participants and we've tried to put the fun there we do have a couple of prizes but they're sort of low key it's not medals and trophies it's things like sharpies and and fun things like that okay so that's the bit about the history um this is a typical weekend um in a, in a fairly fairly uh boring way really i suppose it's presented a bit but um fridays um you can arrive if you want um, that's my personal preference if i can try and get away early from work um and uh, set off and get there Settle down, put your tent up if you're staying in a tent or uh, if it's an Airbnb or, or local hostelry or something like that. And then go to local f um, pub, get us some takeaway, etc. and just settle in. You may prefer if you haven't got the time and the freedom to do that to arrive on Saturday morning. No problem. Uh, there is a briefing, but we've, we're happy to wait and, and brief accordingly. And then there'll be a task in the morning on the Saturday, followed by a, a light lunch and then another task. And they're all briefed. Um, brief beforehand and explain beforehand you fly that and then hopefully once the wind has dropped off and it's become a little calmer then we'll have a precision task briefing and then we'll fly the precision task followed hopefully by a barbecue bit of food um, and uh, a few drinks and then Sunday breakfast optional task three that was another change we made if you you want to shoot off and get home um, then you can do or you can fly an optional task brief presentation and then return home um, you know last year I was home on both occasions in a sensible time rather than we used to fly sometimes two tasks on a Sunday and you get home quite exhausted on the Sunday for the for the week ahead. So that's the that's the typical weekend. The Saturday is the busy one and, and Friday and Sunday are a little bit more more laid back. What we are planning for Darley Moore, Colin and myself is we do plan to offer people a chance to fly a, a simpler task on Friday just to check it, check on systems and see how you're getting on and familiarize yourself with the local area. And you can do that if you want. Um, but then there'll be a, a two tasks on Saturday and one on the Sunday as well. Now, um, I sent this link round. We're conscious of bandwidth um, and we're just going to skip through this because we've replaced it with a few other slides, really. But I would highly recommend if you click on this YouTube clip link or the one I sent round, it's Colin talking through a typical task. Um, and it was a navigation along a known track. A couple of things to pick up is that what you are given is an A4 sheet. It will be a printout of a quarter mil map with a track line drawn on it. Um, and you can use that to fly. I would suggest that you use that chart to fly on rather than transpose it to um, your own map because sometimes you might make errors when transposing. And really what you're assessed for is accuracy and your ability to spot photos. The way in which you're scored for accuracy is you're all given, or well, you can use a phone for uh, in effect, a logger, um, a GPS logger, and that tells us where you've been. And we see if you've gone through gates, uh, occasionally sometimes if you need to. And also if you are on track, then in, ideally you should spot photos. So it's a bit like a, an aerial orienteering. So that's really what we're looking at is your ability to fly accurately um, and, your, your, your nav and assess your navigation skills. Colin, I'll hand over to you if that's all right. Okay. Um, we didn't practice this before, and it's been a month since we did it, so I think I think it's your turn to uh, turn to talk. Okay, thank you. Um, the idea here is is we're just trying to give you some hints and tips on how to um, approach flying the tasks. This is in the air, so that you try to reduce your workload. Um, lowering the workload means you can sort of enjoy it a bit better, and you're more likely to spot the photographs. It's probably worth saying that if you ask any any of the sort of seasoned um, competition. Uh, pilots will give you a different set of hints and tips but, uh, but the game re really is is to get everybody's bit of information and decide what works for you really but th this first one um, is about setting yourself up for the start typically the the chart you'll be given will have probably a red line like this um, and the first thing you need to do is go to the start point which is sp on, on, the, on, the, on the chart um, it might sound obvious, but the best thing to do is rather than fly straight to SP from Dali Moon in this case, and then immediately turn on track and then start thinking, right, what am I doing? Where am I going? What am I aiming for? What am I looking for? The best thing to do is, is identify the start point um, from a little way out, make sure you've got the right junction, and then 
track away from it and then run into the start point in, in a straight line. In this instance, you can see that uh, just to the north, the east of uh, Kubli, there's another village there. So you fly over that village and then fly towards Kubli and over the junction. And all of a sudden, you've started the task and you're pointing in the right direction and there's no sort of stress or aggravation. You, you, you've got your features in the distance that you're looking for and you can immediately start looking for forward as soon as you cross the line and uh, and one down. Um, and that, that means that you're, you're sort of settled once you get started. Um, next one, please, Owen. What have you got here? Oh, yeah. OK. Um, as Owen said earlier, the, the, the idea is, is that you you need to fly exactly down the line that you're given. Um, it's no good knowing where the line was and flying near it. You need to fly over the top of it. Really. So it's all, all about absolute precision. Um, and w one of the things it's easy to do um, is to sort of demonstrate with this sort of black line here is, is to literally be looking out of the plane window, looking at where you think the line, looking at the junctions and as you were passed over things, you need to make sure you absolutely fly straight over the top of them and not start looking further down the line for your, your next turn point. And down at the turn point on this particular line, you can see um, this particular person spotted the turn point and wandered off in the new direction before actually passing over the turn point. And the turn point will give you, that'll be a scoring gate, so you'll you'll miss out on getting points by not going on like that, that, um, that gate. And also, the, the further away you are from the line, the, the less likely you are to, to sort of see see the photos that you're looking for. Um, next one. All right. Okay, yeah, precision turns. Um, on this one, um, you can see the black line is the, the, the flow and track. Um, it's a good idea to fly what we um, describe as a precision turn. So that's instead of coming down this track and then turning right and flying up the, the, the new line, um, do a precision turn. So you fly past the um, the turn point um, for a little while, you know, for, for four or six hundred metres, and then turn around and then do the same thing you did at the start line, line yourself up over the turn point, get yourself set up and start looking um, up the track line to, to where to where your new sort of aiming points are. It's also worth thing on this one as well. As you as you're running in, just as you're going over the disused railway line and then over the village, um, it, it's if you've got the the capacity, if you know where you are and everything's going well, is start looking where the arrow points um, um, and see see if you can identify features up there so that when you do make your turn you you thought you know what you're going to roll out to have, have a look at you can also see the road on here uh, 010 just to the left and um, that's the heading to roll out onto just again as, a, as an, another double check just so that you um you, you reduce the workload and everything should hopefully slot into place um, Owen's also drawn on these. He's uh, highlighted the the track line in yellow, and that's something we often do as well. So we'll just run over the track line with a highlighter. It works particularly when when the map's busy, so that allows that bit to, on the map to stand out all the time. And so you don't have to keep finding the, the red line in among all the other red lines and orange lines and all the rest of it. Right. Okay. Another one. So on this one, we're flying from southeast to northwest, um, and the, this particular track line doesn't really sort of follow any road features. You're crossing things, but you um, there's, there aren't any really sort of good um, fixes. So in, in this sort of situation, it's a good idea to, to what, when you get established on your line to to lift your head and look up the track line a long way. Um, to see if you can find something in the distance. I mean, in this particular case, um, this is Stoke on Trent. There's almost bound to be some sort of chimney on the horizon, which you can use as a a, a reference, so that when you're looking down at the at the features and back up again, you can you can just check to make sure you're pointing to, just to the right of the chimney that you had in mind. That sort of thing. You don't get too focused on looking down all the time. Um, I mean, obviously, you need to look up. Um, just to look around as part of your natural airmanship, but it, it is very easy to to think, oh, I'm not really sure where I'm going in the right direction. And then when you do look up, you suddenly find a massive, great big something or other in front of you. It, it, it can even be a, you know a lake or something you might might not necessarily spot until you look up the line, and then suddenly you've got this great feature to to uh, to navigate off really. Uh, 
this is a, a bit of preparation. And um, on this one, you can see that the, in the bottom left-hand corner is an example of a photograph that you might be given. So this would be one of your, your eight or ten photos you're given. Um, and this sort of thing, you, you look at this on the ground, oh, look, I've got, I've got river, canal, and what looks like a railway line. Um, let, let me run my finger down the track line to see if I can find out where that might be. This one is a little bit over obvious, but it, it's fairly fairly obvious it's likely to be in that sort of area. Um, but having having done that, um, take the time to look at it closely with your magnifying glass or whatever, so that you, you actually know where it is. Because when once you're flying, you'll need to identify that that point and draw a line across that on the chart to to to, to know where you found it. And while you know, looking at that, is, well, that could that that could easily be anywhere within three or four uh, millimeters of, of of where it crosses the line. So it, it's worth and um, having a good look and seeing right. So the I'm, I'm over the top of the canal and the rivers to the left, the railways to the right. Where does that happen? Uh, it only happens sort of kind of at that one place, I think. Um, so that must be where the um, and, it's, and you can do this with all all of the photos. Is get have a look at them before and see where you think they might be. You know, if you've got forests in them, then you can. Oh, I'll I'll, I'll check for that forest. What waterways and things like that as well. But every time you pass over a, a lake or a canal or a river or something, check the, the photos that you've already um, decided that you've got water and then just go back over them. And the reason why. We do this sort of thing. It's just so that you're reducing the workload while you're flying, so that um, it, it becomes manageable, really. So that you, the, the, the more time you can spend actually physically looking at the ground to find the features, the more successful you'll be. So you're not looking at the photographs in detail while you're in the air. You, you're really just recalling from your your memory what you saw when you looked at them in detail on the ground. Really. And I think that's that. Okay, so just just um, we talked a lot about photos. The first thing to say is it's not a World Championships. This is the World Championships uh, last year. So what is there? Two, four, six, eight, ten, and in fact we were flying with twenty photos. And these are quite difficult ones because if you take Colin's advice, he's just given you of trying to find some trees in some crops, it's quite difficult. Um, but this one here, there's a road junction, um, and there's a road running up here. And there's a curve in the road and these are quite difficult. All right. So we will not make them as difficult as this. Um, in these examples, they've been highlighted, which is the feature that you're looking for. Um, and looking at the chart beforehand is a really good idea. And it's not just looking for photos. It's also just to almost visually fly the route in your head. Well, what will it look like whilst I'm flying down it? Okay, I'm going to cross over a reservoir. Then a, a major road, a, a yellow road here. Don't need to know the name of it, but that's going to come from left to right. Oh, and then I've got a set of power cables. Then another set of power cables. Then I'm going to come into this roundabout, do my precision turn, as Colin has said, and I'm going to look up here. There's lots going on. Let's just um, zoom zoom out a little bit. I've got a disused airfield to my right. I would have Stoke-on-Trent to the left. And actually... This is great for navigation because I've got a railway line I'm going to follow and there's all these other features. Oh, and there might be a photo coming in there. So spending that time beforehand, before jumping in your machine and enthusiastically whizzing off is time well spent. And um, you'll often see pilots who have done it before, you know, just focusing, studying the map, making sure, you know, going through it in their mind as to what they might be doing. Because, you know, anything you can do, workload, reducing workload is is a real, real key. OK, um, now. Well, to add to that, um, if you're two, you're two crew, um, whoever's sort of designated as the main sort of spotter, is probably, uh, probably not the pilot, they can be continuing to analyse the photographs while the pilot's getting the plane ready, started up, warming it up and taxing it all out. All that time's valuable for staring you even closer at the photographs, really. A lot can be can be sort of um, found out in, in, in that time, especially when you're out in the, the, out in the bright you know, in the bright sunshine in the plane. Yeah. And another thing to add is always look at the corners of the photos. So this photo 20 down here, there's a lake. You can see a lake. There's a little island. But there's also something here, which is a railway line just in the corner. So occasionally the organisers do tuck things in there and look carefully for things like power lines and cables and things which can be seen 
um, and you can see where they are in the fields and which orientation they are as well. The photos will always be taken in the, in the direction of the track. And I think that's another thing to note, um, not from a different direction. So they'll all be, they, they will look as they are seen as you are flying on track. Okay, so if you're flying in the right direction, that's how they should they should look. Um, so um, now analyzing your flying, this is something you could do between now and the 22nd, 23rd of April, if you've got the, the right bits of software. There's a few links a little bit later. Um, there's a, This is a, a Google Map overlay, and this is a, 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 a Compi GPS. There's all sorts of bits of software out there. Um, this live track uh, software, which we've used. Um, and I think it makes a big difference where you think you were and where you actually were. Spending a bit of time using the power of technology um, is incredibly important. Now, I'm just speaking openly here because I can't remember which uh, point, sorry this about this, at which point Giles jumps in and gives his um, experience of, of doing a, the start of a task. Um, but um, I'm hoping he might either chip in now or we'll, we'll wait for a minute in a second. <laughs> um, so analyzing your flying, using the power of the technology, whether it's on Sky Demon or anything similar, really, really helps. Um, and you'll notice there's a couple of different overlays, whether it's Google or whether it's uh, an OS map, um, and you can see where lines um, go. I will put these slides together into a PDF afterwards, and you can click on these links and have a play. But um, it will get you through the winter months, uh, and it will make your flying certainly more accurate to analyze where you've been and where you thought you've been. Okay, now, equipment. Um, Quarter mil map for the area. Uh, we will give you a, um, a task sheet with, with it on, um, but legally it's a good idea to have that quarter mil map. And it's also a good idea just to see if there's something hiding behind a line or something along those lines. It's also good for checking airspace and any restricted areas. Um, on the briefing, uh, no TAMs will be gone through and people will pick up and highlight areas of interest and areas that you need to be careful of. Um, Sharpie, uh, if you are going to mark onto your chart, but a fine or extra fine pens are incredibly useful, um, not thick marker pens. Uh, a ruler, scale ruler, protractor, important, and sellotape. Something people experiment with is the different types of tape. Um, and one of Colin's tips is to use the masking tape and put that alongside the track line, and that enables you to see through it and also mark on there. So if you get a chance to play about with uh, different tape, that's useful. Uh, and don't do the mistake that I did in, you know, tape your, your sheet onto your board and then you take off and it all flies off within 30 seconds because you've never tried it before. And you realize the cheap stuff you bought from the pound shop wasn't very good. Um, and then you have a very boring um, afternoon. OK, um, map boards. Now, um, there's a tutorial which we can send around afterwards. Um, number of people fly with the kind of traditional fly like map board, which is which is great. Um, but um, when Giles speaks, he'll talk a little bit about a rotating map board. Um, and if you are flying a trike and you've got a bit of time and you can make a rotating map board, in effect, it gives you track up rather than having to twist your head and things like that, which I think makes a which makes a difference. OK, now, Giles, where are you? Are you there still? Yep, still here. OK, would you like to jump in now? Because um, before I start talking about precision tasks, if you could give us um, a bit of an insight into your experience from even just getting up, trying to follow the line, what you found out and lessons learned and what you would do next yep. time, that would be really useful. Okay. Yeah. Well, first off, following the last presentation, I've got myself a magnifying glass. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, getting all the kit. And yes, I've got low, low tack and high tack tape as well. Went to, uh, was it B&Q and bought a load of that. Uh, bits, and bits and pieces. Now, the last presentation, I showed off my... Um, cobbled together uh, map board, um, which, as Owen's already said, um, I did when I did a task, Owen sent me a task in January and I haven't actually completed that task yet because of either work, weather or weather and a bit more weather. So uh, I've still got that to fly. I have a practice on. But I went out to just see how I would get on. I didn't have any pictures with me, but the point I wanted to get across to myself was to learn I know how to navigate. I can navigate from A to B. I can get there reasonably well. But it's not so much about navigation. It's about being on the line. And those are the points that Colin has already alluded to earlier. But it's surprisingly difficult being on the line. And I think we called it a corridor, didn't we, Colin? 
Yes. Uh, yeah, so you've got a, a graduated corridor and you're within 250 metres of that line. Now, that seems like a big sort of bandwidth, 500 metres, but it's surprisingly difficult to stay within that. Um, as uh, when Owen analysed my track, I was nowhere near it at all. So uh, it was definitely, I know where I am, but I don't know where I need to be. Uh, and this is where I think a lot of the time um, during our post sort of uh, event discussion, I think Colin said you actually end up flying with one hand on the bar while tracking your finger down the line to make sure that you know where you are. Um, identifying features, even though I've had time to go and look where those features might be, it's very hard to see them or, or pick them out off the um, off the map board. Uh, and, and so I think you said the tolerance was one or two millimetres, isn't it? One millimetre either side? Uh, yeah, two, two millimetres total tolerance. Two millimetres to, uh, to identify where the pictures are. And these are all things I didn't know when I went out. It was like, well, I know where that is. But the cheeky thing I, I found out afterwards, the picture puts you back on track. So if you see where the track is and where the picture is, get back on top of the picture. And then that will bring you back on track, um, says me, that's, that got completely lost. Um, again, not knowing about the procedural turns at the, at the end of turn points. But if nothing else, having a spinning map board, and I think this is where uh, a few people, even on the trike side of things there's owens that is an absolute work of art that isn't it owen but the ability to tape your uh, a4 piece of paper there's collins uh, the ability to tape your a4 piece of paper to it and have track up because the pictures are also track dependent aren't they owen yeah they are you, yeah so you will only see them in the orientation of the track they're not north up as you would sort of naturally do in google um, so in short, being able to spin your chart, it's bigger than A4, so it allows you to tape around the edge, uh, and have the pictures available. Uh, I have taken my, um, my waterproof cover off, Owen. I'm back down to just plain uh, Corex now. Um, yeah, and the ability to just analyse them. And that's why I jokingly showed this, because I was surprised how much I couldn't see when I'd drawn my line on the chart and then drew over the features. So it's draw a line and stop before the features and then start again on the other side of it. And that way you don't lose the feature underneath it. Uh, so I'm not going to ramble on too much longer, but I say it was just as you've already alluded to, Owen, I just needed to have done more prep and be able to keep my track up. So I will stop there and hand back to you. Okay, and if for people who Giles has done a, an interview with Colin, which he's put on his YouTube, uh, and I think he also did some reflections on this. He's very honest, which is great, um, and I think it's a slightly different type of flying to what you're used to, Giles. I think that's fair to say. Um, but I think um, Giles has, has quite rightly talked about the equipment, and and we've talked a lot about workload. And my map board isn't that attractive. It's it's Corex, which um, Giles talked about, which you can get from Amazon and various things, or. Uh, for sale sign this is quite a functional one from um last year with a, a few extra bits but the rotating map board makes a difference reduces workload and enables you to obviously fly track up all the time so if you get chance then um you know play have a play with that and also fly with it and set yourself a simple task on a quarter mil map switch off the sky demon or tuck it in your pocket and go and have a little play and see what it feels like okay so i'm just there's a picture there of a map board giles go on you're, you're muted um, I think you even identified last time when we did this presentation that even if you do have GPS and I had my GPS running, the scaling and detail just aren't aren't high enough to keep you on track. It's it actually is. I found it almost counterproductive having the GPS there. And I think you came up with a story that someone was accused of flying on GPS and they compared it to one of the the uh, more seasoned pilots and the more seasoned pilot was more accurate flying by eye than by GPS. Yeah. Yeah. No. I think the point about the GPS is that if sometimes if you go and do a task like this and it's alien and it's different, the biggest fear is that you're so preoccupied by what we've said tonight, gates, photos, accuracy and stuff that you perhaps think and forget about the maybe the bigger picture. So the tunnel vision could be counterproductive. And let's say you do find yourself temporarily unsure of your position, which we've all done. Um, because you've been flying a corridor, as you say it, and then you look up and go, oh, bloody hell, where am I? If you've got a GPS with you or a Sky Demon and you can look at it and reassure yourself, that's a good thing to have. And I think 
you know, that's the difference. Open series, we don't, we've got no issues with that. Somebody saying, well, where am I? Bang, I know my position instantly, rather than flying around looking at um, road signs, for example. Yeah. So uh, obviously, I'm not advocating that. Okay. Now, um, <laughs> we'll just go back a couple of slides if I can. Um, and we're just going to talk about precision, precision tasks. Now, again, it, it could be in the naming here, but they used to be called spot landings. And we had a discussion about this. But really, we're, we're, we're trying to say, right, short field landings. Um, I talked about landing on a predetermined spot, um, but thinking about the numbers that you would land on. And it depends where you fly from. Um, and um, I used to fly from Oakley and lots of space there. And actually, you could land anywhere you want. And it was great. And some of us are flying from now shorter farm strips. So if you're thinking really of it being a precision, a precision landing, I think it takes words spot out of it. Um, and we used to have, it, you know, you would switch off your engine and do a glide, descend and round into this box. For people who have not done um, an open series before, we say that you must do it on tick over um, and, and you do it in a controlled manner. Uh, some of the more experienced pilots may decide to switch their engine off if they want and do a proper dead stick landing as such. But we insist if you've not done one before that you keep the engine on tick over just in case um, you get into any difficulties. So what you do is you climb up and in fact at Darley Moor last year we had um, Angela on the uh, on marshalling doing a great job um, and we had three aircraft I think in the air at any one time we'd have one climbing we'd have one um, continuing to climb and one descending down on one side so it's all controlled um, and it was fine no problems at all and nobody had any conflicts or anything like that. Um, you come across you take off you climb up to about a thousand feet and then you approach the box at a thousand and then you come off the power as you enter. This is called the deck. OK, and the deck is 100 meters. It's broken down into five meter boxes. You can see in this photo down here where my, ma my mouse is that that's a five meter box with this uh, tape. Darley Moore last year, we had it mown. It's quite clear. You've got a few cones usually at the start of the deck and you come in and try and ultimately land as close to the start here. OK. Um, don't get fixated on the points. I think the thing in that in this case is just to do a precision, neat, tidy, accurate landing. Um, Colin, have you got anything to add? Um, any hints or tips or any any things that, that further to what I've just said? <clears throat> uh, I think yeah, I'll just reiterate the goal. The goal is really to do a perfect landing and then hope that ends, ends up in the box really what we're not trying to do is stretch the glide or land fast and hit the box the idea is is to build up a picture in your mind of what the final approach needs to look like to, to land in in exactly the right place and practicing it um is the name of the game really you know just have, have a go stick something by the side of your, your runway if you're able to and then see if you can put your wheels down somewhere near it every single time you know be it be it with power or not really get the idea of just of looking get an idea in your mind what what it's supposed to look like as you turn final and run down towards the ground there and as soon as you once you've done it five six times it, it suddenly starts to be um a lot easier really um, uh, pra practice but there's, there's no reason to bend your aircraft or you know heavy landings or anything like that really and um, if you if you can't make the box land before the box it's all it's all runway all usable yeah so what we would do on our saturday night hopefully is we'll do two of those possibly three depending on the number of aircraft entering um and that gives you a chance to have another go and I think last year, Graham Daniels, who was a relative newcomer to the, the Open Series, had a good couple of goes. And then the next morning, he got up early and then had another few goes and just had a good bit of fun you know, with the box and actually became much, much more confident and got better and better and better. Uh, this is in the uh, Czech Republic. And this is, I think it's me, coming in in a quick R, which, as you know, is not perhaps the best short field machine. Quite low, quite slow, quite slow. And a little bit firm into the start of the box. And actually, I think we stopped in 60 or 70 meters or so. But um, please um, practice at your own airfield and uh, come along and enjoy them. Now, I think my personal view is they're, they're three or four minutes of the most exciting flying when you get it right. Um, and it's very satisfying when you get it right. And it's very frustrating when you get it a little bit wrong and you kick yourself and then you go and practice and practice and practice. Um, but uh, and. I remember one time I'd flown in a in a in an event down at Playstows. I was flying home and guess what? I had an engine failure. Yeah. And guess what? I managed to put it straight in a field exactly where I wanted to because I've been flying all weekend 
And I was absolutely dialed into um, dealing with that sort of eventuality. So it makes you, I think, a much safer pilot as a, as a consequence. Yeah, um, so for the beginners, um, the, la the landings are optional. You don't need to take part in it. And indeed, on your first visit to a, a one of these uh, meetings, you, you might well be happy to sit by the side and watch what everybody else does, watch what the preparation looks like and what's going on, and then take part next time or, you know, at the end if you want. Really. Not, none of this is mandatory. You can, you can pick and choose which bits you want to take part in. And another thing to add is sometimes at the end of a task, there might be a precision landing element and that would be a powered precision landing. So that won't be joining in the overhead and descending downwind and, and, and trying to land into the box, but that would be a powered approach. Um, and, and they are nice to sort of get your get your eye in and get become familiar with it as well. All right. So uh, sometimes we might put those at the end of the task, but probably not the first task on the Saturday. Um, just to just let people settle in a bit. Um, so what next? Hopefully you've picked up some hints and tips and you're inspired to have a go and you're thinking, right, I'm, I'm tempted to have a go and sign up for Darley Moore on the 22nd to 23rd of April. Um, if you can, between now and then, and hope for the weather to break and get away from all this miserable, low pressure, wet stuff, and we get a break in the weather, practice on your own, you know, practice drawing some lines and trying to follow them and analyze your, your flying. Think about what equipment, think, think differently to what you would take for a cross country flight or, or for a little local jolly. Uh, think how you can reduce workload. Think about map boards or pens or um, where your pens might go. Um, you know, where, if you've got a stopwatch, where are you going to position it? Uh, and just give a bit of thought as to your cockpit, I suppose. Um, precision landings, like Colin suggested, you know, putting something by the side of your runway and trying to hit that point, not hit it physically, but land next to it each time. I know where I now fly from. I've got, um, as a menage, like a horse exercise area, and that is my start of my box that I that I think about. And just in case you're thinking of Darnley Moore, hopefully, this is the type of task which might change a little bit. Colin's given me a bit of feedback on this, but this would be, a typical task taking off from Darley Moor, flying um, up to the roundabout, which would be the start point. Nice, nice clear start point. We're trying to make the tasks as straightforward for people who have not done them before. Uh, flying down here with a disused railway line, crossing um, this roundabout, uh, major road, down to the south of Utoxeter, for example, and down here with this reservoir. Colin's already talked about this area down here by Hickson with the disused railway line and all these lovely features. And then back across and back to Cubley and back to Darling Moor. It's quite a short, straightforward task, um, but that's the sort of thing which we're thinking of. And in this area where the navigation is nice and straightforward, and we've got things like, you know, for example, if you're going on this leg here, which has been highlighted, and you get a bit bit drifting off track, you've got this lovely big power line to bring you back in. For example, you down here, you've got the reservoir as a, as a start point. So we're not going to take you off into the middle of nowhere and say, right you know, give us precision navigation in those areas. So that just gives you um, a bit of a, a bit of a flavor for it. That's the start point highlighted there. Just I hope that video was really useful. As I said at the beginning, if you've got any questions, say if you've got this far, well done, but say if you've got any questions that are screaming in your mind, you want to know more information uh, about fueling or how much fuel, etc., limitations, please drop them in the comments and I will get those questions answered for you. Hopefully that was interesting and enough information that would want to encourage you. Additionally, there are links in the description if you want to sign up or they'll be put on whatever social media links this video goes to. As I said, I hope this was useful. Until next time, everybody, fly safe. <laughs>